Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what I consider to be the end of the beginning. The, the, we're really clearly reaching a, a new phase in the war against drugs. Uh, on June the 17th next year, we'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary since the 37th President of the United States of America, Richard Nixon, declared the war on drugs. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about the fact that we can celebrate mission completely unaccomplished. And you remember those wonderful words that uh, the 43rd US President uh, uttered on the deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and I've slightly paraphrased his words here to say, in the battle over the drugs, the United States and its allies have not prevailed. And that's clearly the case. I want to show you some data here that indicates just how clear the evidence is. Now, I haven't carefully selected the data and thrown out data that contradicts the proposition I'm putting to you. I've simply collected the data that is there in abundance. And I'll also be showing you some thought bubbles from our leaders around the world. Now, in uh, 1998, in the United Nations in New York, uh, UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, said, a drug-free world, we can do it. Well, how did they go with opium? So here you can see opium production uh, worldwide uh, uh, going from under 4,000 tonnes to uh, end up at over 9,000 metric tonnes in 2007. So this is over a 17-year period. But in this 10-year period from 1998 to 2007, uh, global opium production increased by 103%, so more than doubled. So they didn't quite get to the drug-free world that they were telling us they would get to. And global cocaine production uh, increased by 20% from 1998 to 2007. And cannabis production, I haven't got the full 10 years, I wasn't able to find that, it dipped a little bit and then it rose. Overall, it's a 36% increase over six years. Hard to estimate global cannabis production, um, but it's clear that it's, that's increasing, consumption's increasing. And if we look here at Australian figures, this is the illicit drug reporting system in the eight year period from 2000 to 2007. The uh, pale blue at the top are people who said that heroin was very easy to obtain the darker blue are people who said it was easy. And you can see here that in 2007, 85% of Australian heroin users said that heroin was either easy or very easy to obtain. The most recent figures, 2009, that's now up to 90%. And remember, this is supposedly in an era of a heroin shortage. So even in a heroin shortage, heroin for drug users is easy or very easy to obtain for the overwhelming majority. And so it is too for cocaine. Now in 2007, 60% of drug users said cocaine was easy or very easy to obtain. By 2009, that 60% had gone up to 80%. So that would now be, the blue bars would be covering 80% of the bar in 2009. Methamphetamine, uh, 80%, and that's still at 80%, uh, so it was 80% in 2007 and in 2009. And this is cannabis uh, in the period 2004-2007, and the green bars represent hydroponic cannabis, and you can see that's uh, uh, 89, 89, 91, 89% uh, saying that cannabis, hydroponic cannabis is easy or very easy to obtain, and different varieties of cannabis uh, at lower rates of availability. So it's very clear that heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, and cannabis for drug users are easy or very easy to obtain. And we have similar figures in other countries. Now, these are the global figures for heroin and cocaine prices. Uh, Peter Reuter is a very distinguished uh, Australian who's uh, defected to the United States many years ago. Franz Troutman, a, a distinguished German researcher living in the Netherlands. And this work was commissioned by the European Commission in the year 2009. Uh, and you can see here heroin and cocaine prices, heroin in the, in the black, uh, cocaine in, sorry, heroin in the, in the pale gray with the triangles and cocaine in the, in the black. 
and you can see an 80% uh, decline over 22 years. This is from the website of the DEA in the United States of America, and here in 1990, uh, a unit of heroin uh, cost $3.90, and this had come down to 80 cents by 1999. Purity had gone up from 3.6% to 38%. And this is from the DEA website. Uh, going back to Europe now, and here we have... Um, uh, seven different kinds of drugs, two different kinds of cannabis, cocaine, heroin, amphetamines, ecstasy, and LSD. And the price of drugs over five years decreases. The, the smallest decrease was 10%. The largest decrease was 50%. And that was uh, the decreasing price of ecstasy over that period. Now we're looking at uh, retail prices of heroin and uh, in the USA and Europe. The US is in the, in the blue. The uh, Europe is in that magenta colour, and you can see a 65% reduction in price for heroin, 70% reduction in price for US, 70% reduction in price for Europe over 16 years, and cocaine, similar, uh, falls 65% in the United States, 50% in Europe. So these are not, I repeat, these are not carefully selected just to show you uh, the bad bits. This is what all the data looks like. Now, if it's an even starker contrast when we compare inputs to outputs, uh, to outcomes. So this is the US, uh, the number of uh, person, inmates, serving sentences for drug-related offences in the United States, starting off at 50,000 in 1981 and going up to 500,000 in 2003, so over a 22-year period a tenfold increase in the number of people serving prison sentences, jail or prison sentences for drug-related offences. And during that time, we see this spectacular 80% decrease in the price of heroin and cocaine. And if we look at uh, another input, here is expenditure, uh, foreign expenditure by the United States to try and uh, eradicate or interdict uh, drugs moving around the world. And so here we see the price, the, the expenditure increase from $500 million in 1981 to $4 billion, almost an eightfold increase in 23 years. And again, we see this dramatic slide in the retail price of heroin and cocaine. So I think there's a convincing story here that uh, drug prohibition is failing. And the, many people around the world have come to that conclusion, and uh, in many parts of the world now there are uh, very distinguished judges or deans of uh, medicine or vice chancellors or uh, other distinguished establishment figures coming out and saying exactly um, what I'm just saying to you now, that drug prohibition is, has clearly failed. Now, let's ask ourselves the question, why is this no surprise? Why would we expect prohibition to be a futile exercise? Well, if we think about it, we clearly can't keep drugs out of our prisons. Um, we, whenever researchers look for drugs in prison, and often they're not, of course, allowed to do that, but when they do look for drugs in prison, they always find them. Uh, we also have the example of the spectacular failure of alcohol prohibition in the United States from 1920 to 1933, so much so that the severe social costs of keeping alcohol pro prohibition going resulted in the repeal of the 18th Amendment um, in 1933, so that uh, uh, alcohol was once again taxed and regulated and made available legally. Um, think about it another way, a, a kilo of heroin in Patpong Road, Bangkok, will cost you $1,000 wholesale. Uh, and when that kilo of heroin comes to King's Cross or St Kilda or Fortitude Valley, uh, it will sell for about, around about $250,000. Similar prices in Australia, New York, Paris, London, Amsterdam. So there's a spectacular 250-fold increase in price there's always going to be someone sufficiently ruthless, someone sufficiently desperate, willing to take the risk, whatever that risk is, 
uh, of transporting the drug. And if that risk is made even higher by expanding the drug squads or making the penalties more prolonged, more severe, uh, then there's a com compensatory increase in price and therefore an even greater increase in profits. So there'll always be someone willing to do that. Another problem for the drug law enforcement people is that the drug traffickers are better resourced than drug law enforcement. Uh, remember sitting watching the film Traffic and where the, uh, Michael Douglas is playing the, US, the new US drug czar and he's being shown around a, uh, a real drug law enforcement centre, I think in Texas, and he says to the person showing him around, how come we're not doing better in the war against drugs? And the guy says to him, the drug traffickers are even better resourced than we are. And that's clearly true. I was um, in southeast Iran, close to the border in Pakistan, and people there were telling me how the, the um, drug traffickers in Baluchistan province, which was nearby, uh, drove these fancy late model cars, much better equipped in terms of radar and high tech than the Iranian law enforcement authorities had. Um, it's a needle in a haystack logistics. Australia has around about uh, 8 million people entering and leaving every year by, by air. We have about 2 million containers every year. Uh, we were searching 1 in 1,000 containers. We're now searching 3 in 1,000 containers. Well, clearly, uh, it's, um, it's an uphill battle trying to detect all the drugs in that. Um, and as I said, if you expand uh, and intensify drug law enforcement, you increase the profits. If you increase the profits, inevitably, there'll be more people wanting to traffic drugs. Uh, now, apart from the futility and the failure of drug prohibition, uh, another problem we have to deal with is the severe unintended negative consequences. And these are even ad admitted to by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And this statement comes from the UNODC website where they say global drug control efforts have had a dramatic unintended consequence. A criminal black market of staggering proportions. Organised crime is a threat to security. Criminal organisations have the power to destabilise society and governments. The illicit drug business is worth billions of dollars a year, part of which is used to corrupt governments, officials and to poison economies. And here in Melbourne we've seen in recent years 36 gangland murders, We've seen a leader of one of the gangs murdered in what was supposed to be the most secure prison in Victoria, something that uh, we're, I guess we're all laymen here, but it's unimaginable that this could have occurred without some sort of uh, official corruption allowing that to happen. We've also seen, as part of that exercise, two police witnesses under protection, under witness protection, who were also murdered. So these adverse effects uh, don't think that these just apply in Mexico and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, they occur, they have occurred right here in Melbourne. Uh, there's uh, a, a correlation between violence and drug prohibition. Uh, the International Centre for the Study of Drug Prohibition in Vancouver uh, published this year a study where they analysed 306 uh, papers on drug law enforcement and violence. 15 of those studies met their pre-designated scientific standards and 13, that was 87%, found that increasing drug law enforcement led to increasing drug market violence, exactly what we're seeing in Mexico now. And nine of the 11 studies, 82%, uh, regression analysis of longitudinal data showed increasing drug law enforcement again uh, led to increasing violence. Uh, only one study uh, showed came to the opposite conclusion. And there's the website there if you want to read the full study. So there are a lot of severe unintended negative cons consequences and we're getting to understand them even better. We have half a dozen narco states in the world. By narco states we mean uh, where the drug traffickers and the government uh, difficult to distinguish. And those of you who have been following the WikiLeaks in recent days will have seen ample uh, material there about the narco state in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Mexico. 
So here they are, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Burma, Cambodia, Peru, Bolivia, Mexico, and they're not always NICA states all at the same time. Some of them move in and out. But it's a serious situation when we have uh, around about half a dozen governments of the world totally corrupted by narco traffickers. That's a very severe unintended negative consequence. This is uh, an annual survey of um, national security in the United States carried out by a very high level military uh, organization, the United States Joint Forces Command, and they produced this report um, towards the end of every year. When this report came out in 2008, um, it didn't mention the connection between uh, the, the problems of uh, Mexico and Pakistan but, uh, and, poor, and the security threat that that posed to the United States. But a lot of people immediately connected the dots, and there was a lot of discussion in the media about that. So the, the Joint Forces Command said, in terms of worst-case scenarios for the Joint Force, and indeed the world, two large and important states bear consideration for a rapid and sudden collapse, Pakistan and Mexico. The Mexican government, its politicians, police, and judicial infrastructure are all under sustained assault and pressure by criminal gangs and drug cartels. Now, many people have the idea that the recognition that drug prohibition was a failure is a fairly recent development. But in fact, there were people very early on in the piece who came to that conclusion. And this is a statement uh, that's over 100 years old. And at the time, the Commonwealth Controller General of Customs was required to report to the Australian, the new Australian Federal Parliament uh, about uh, the raising of revenue by taxation in Australia. Uh, up until 1906, it was possible for Australian citizens to buy taxed, regulated, edible opium, uh, opium for eating, uh, from grocery shops. And uh, th this brought a handy income to the new Australian government. Uh, but in 1906, this uh, policy was reversed and edible opium was prohibited for sale. And the Comptroller General of Customs in 1908 in his report to Parliament says, owing to total prohibition, the price of opium has risen enormously. The Commonwealth gladly gave up about £60,000 in revenue. What now appears to be the effect of total prohibition is that while we have lost the duty, the opium is still imported pretty freely. 20 one years ago, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Crime Authority, which was, had Liberal and Labor politicians represented on it, concluded that all the evidence shows, however, not only that our law enforcement agencies have not succeeded in preventing the supply of illegal drugs to Australian markets, but that it is unrealistic to expect them to do so. So this is not a recent uh, recognition. This has been around for quite a while. Three of the members of that committee uh, went on to become senior cabinet ministers in the Howard government, and of course, in the Howard government, they defended prohibition. Milton Friedman, who played a very significant role in advising the Reagan government in the 1980 to 88 period, uh, was on record numerous times uh, arguing that drug prohibition could never succeed. And here's a sample of one of his many quotations on this subject where he said, Drugs are a tragedy for addicts, but criminalising their use converts that tragedy into a society, into a disaster for society, for users and non-users alike. Our experience with the prohibition of drugs is a replay of our experience with the prohibition of alcoholic beverages. I remember one of the first drug law reform conferences I went to in the United States. We were sitting in a room uh, before the meeting started and we were introducing ourselves to this old guy from... Texas uh, in his 80s, a barrister, and going around the room and he said his name and uh, he said, I'm so old, he said, I won't try the American accent, he said, I'm so old, uh, I can remember the last prohibition, he said, but this one is worse than the previous one. And uh, the, the, the connections are so obvious. This is a comment that uh, President George W. Bush made in 2002 when he had a meeting with President Vincente Fox of Mexico, 
and he said, and we have to thank him for his uh, exquisite syntax and grammar, <laughs> as long as there is a demand for drugs in this country, some crook is going to figure out how to get them in. <laughs> thank you, George. Now, this is a quotation from David Cameron. There are lots of wonderful quotations by David Cameron uh, on the, uh, you'll find using Google on this subject. And David Cameron, at that point, was the uh, leader of the opposition, leader of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom in 2005, and now, of course, he's the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And he said then, politicians attempt to appeal to the lowest common denominator by posturing with tough policies and and for calling for crackdown after crackdown. Drug policies have been failing for decades. Not a lot of wiggle room there, David, if you're trying to say that you were misquoted or misinterpreted. And here was Chris Mullen, who chaired the Select Committee on Home Affairs that David Cameron was a member of, and he said, attempts to combat illegal drugs by means of law enforcement have proved so manifestly unsuccessful that it is difficult to argue for the status quo. And again, he said many other comments of a similar nature. In 2003, Tony Blair, then Prime Minister of Great Britain, commissioned a study on drug policy from the Strategy Unit in Whitehall. And this is a private research centre that's available to the Cabinet, uh, for the Cabinet to commission studies from. Uh, at that time, the Strategy Unit was directed by Lord Burt, who had previously been the Director General of the BBC. And this introduction to this report is really meant to convey to you the truth. That this, is, uh, th this is a study that's coming from the bosom of the U UK establishment. Uh, this, uh, to add to the case for the, the importance of this study, this study was intended as a confidential document for the eyes only of the UK cabinet. Uh, somehow the Guardian newspaper got to hear about it and uh, requested under the freedom of information laws that, that they would get this report and uh, ultimately they succeeded in getting the report and they published their report, this report, on their website. And this is one of the conclusions of this report. A sustained seizure rate of over 60% is required to put a successful trafficker out of business. Anecdotal evidence suggests that seizure rates as high as 80% may be needed in some cases. Sustained successful interventions on this scale have never been achieved. Now, this is another critical statement for you, uh, and this comes from no less than UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and he made this as part of a major statement on HIV AIDS uh, on the 7th of May last year. And he said, many countries impose criminal sanctions for same-sex sex, commercial sex, and drug injection. Such laws constitute major barriers to reaching key populations with HIV services. Those behaviours should be decriminalised. Those behaviours should be decriminalised. And people addicted to drugs should receive health services for the treatment of their addiction. Now, since making these comments, and I should add, by the way, that the emphasis on that slide, the yellow, is, is my emphasis, not his. Uh, but since making this comment, uh, the UN system, through UNDP, has set up the Global Commission on HIV and Law, uh, and one of the co-chairs of that, uh, one of the two co-chairs, is Australia's own saint, Michael Kirby, and they are looking at exactly this statement. They're looking at how the law uh, impairs the prevention, treatment and care of men who have sex with men, sex workers and drug injection, and what should be done about that. And it's a very uh, distinguished committee that they've assembled to look at this issue. Now, if the case I'm making has some validity, that prohibition has clearly failed and is futile, how come prohibition, drug prohibition, has survived so long? Uh, the evidence, after all, of failure is very clear. Uh, it's very clear also that expert opinion is on the same side that I'm presenting to you. It's very clear, I think, also that uh, elite politicians across the world have known that drug prohibition has failed and is futile for many decades. Uh, but drug prohibition continues to survive, and I think we have to ask ourselves why that is the case. Is it the case that we have poor advocates 
And we always have to consider the possibility that our advocacy is inept, and maybe that has contributed. Is it because we don't offer an alternative plan? Well, these days we're now offering alternative plans. Is it that we have entrenched self-interest? And clearly there is an element of entrenched self-interest. The police and the corrections officers, and particularly the correction, correction services officers union, are very much involved in advocacy to retain the war on drugs. And I think there's also clearly uh, evidence that uh, drug traffickers uh, want to retain the current system. Um, Ethan Edelman, who some of you will have heard, uh, distinguished US drug law reformers in Australia for the last uh, uh, two weeks almost, um, told me that um, although there was a vote of 46.3% in favour of Proposition 19 in the uh, elections in California on the 2nd of November this year, uh, there was a, a strong majority against Proposition 19 to tax and regulate cannabis in Humboldt County, county in Northern California where a lot of cannabis is, is grown. So I think we can see different kinds of entrenched self-interest, including from drug traffickers themselves. But I think one of the major factors is that uh, support for drug prohibition has really been a form of political Viagra uh, for many years, that um, ageing, often male uh, politicians losing their political potency were able to uh, retain some uh, additional uh, vigour to get them through the the next election and re-elect, get themselves re-elected, clearly that's been uh, a major factor uh, in the long-term survival of drug prohibition, although that effect now seems to be fading. Now, this is a slide I think we should also pay some attention to. This is the distribution of income and equality uh, in uh, developed countries, and over here, uh, Appropriately on, the right, on your right, uh, we see the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Portugal, Israel, Italy, New Zealand. These are countries that are relatively uh, very unequal. And over here, the Scandinavian countries and Japan, countries that are less unequal. And here we see the prevalence of drug use, and we see that the more unequal the countries, uh, the more we see the prevalence of drug use rising. Uh, and this is not just a fanciful uh, observation. There is even laboratory data to support this notion. Uh, this is a study that some of you may have heard of, often referred to as Rat Park, carried out by Bruce Alexander and Barry Bayerstein in Vancouver in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And the hypothesis was a seemingly outrageous notions that drugs do not cause addiction Apparent addiction to opioid drugs in laboratory rats is attributable to their living conditions. And what they did was they allocated rats uh, randomly to four different conditions. Uh, the first group had horrible conditions for 80 days. The cages were too hot or too cold, they were very crowded, there wasn't enough food, it was very noisy, all the things that rats apparently dislike. Uh, the second group were in ideal conditions, so-called rat park, just the right temperature, very quiet, lots of toys, lots of food, uh, and uh, uh, just the right temperature. Uh, and then groups three and four were combinations of groups one and two. And they all kept in these cages for 80 days, and all were supplied with liberal quantities of sweetened morphine solution. And what happened was that the rats in the horrible cages uh, drank 19 times more morphine than the rats in the ideal conditions. And Bruce Alexander's conclusion was that severely distressed animals, like severely distressed people, will relieve their distress pharmacologically if they can. Now, despite the clear importance of this work, Alexander and his colleagues had difficulty getting the work published, and although this work has now been replicated by several other groups, uh, and published in good journals, uh, it's uh, very rarely referred to in the United States. So the picture I want to present to you is that we've got a system that is breaking down uh, and it's not quite clear yet what is going to follow. And so I uh, refer you to this uh, comment by 
the Italian sociologist uh, Gramsci who said, the old is, is dead, but the new is not yet born. So let's try and think for a minute uh, what might be uh, the options. And these really are the only options for, uh, that uh, exist for uh, providing psychoactive drugs uh, to the market, uh, if they are provided in a regulated way. Of course, if they're provided in an un unregulated way, um, we have the severe problems that you know about. Now, this work was carried out by Steve Rolls and was published uh, by Transform, a drug policy reform organisation in the United Kingdom. And Steve Rolls identified five potential controls for psychoactive drugs. One is prescription controls that we're all familiar with. Another is pharmacy controls where you go to the pharmacist and the drugs are either available over the counter but there's some regulatory control by the pharmacist or there are other uh, range of options by the pharmacist that they can, they can adopt. The third is where there are uh, licensed sales. Uh, that is to say, you, uh, and this is some of the cannabis coffee shops follow this model where the, the drugs can be uh, bought but not consumed on the, pre on the premises. Licensed consumption where the drugs are bought and consumed on the premises. Some of the cannabis cafes in the in Netherlands follow that model. And of course, the, uh, our own pubs in Australia follow that model. And then finally, we have unlicensed sales where we sell psychoactive drugs like uh, coffee. Uh, and there's no, there are really almost no checks or balances on that system. So somewhere we're going to have to think about the possibility of controlling and regulating uh, psychedelic drugs in systems like this. Now, what are the alternatives to drug prohibition? Uh, I think the case I've given you, I hope, has convinced you that drug prohibition uh, is not sustainable. What's going to replace it? Well, I think what we will see is that drugs will revert from being primarily a drug law enforcement responsibility to being primarily a health and social issue. Uh, and what that will have to mean is that there'd be increased funding for health and social interventions, roughly up to the levels enjoyed by drug law enforcement. Now, in the words of economists, this is really an argument about allocative efficiency rather than technical efficiency. In other words, to get better results uh, from drug policy, we don't, uh, we're not seeking to make customs, police, courts and prisons more efficient at doing what they do or to make drug treatment or drug education more efficient at what they do. It's a case of saying the system is, doesn't work well because there's a misallocation of resources. So that's called allocative efficiency. Um, and here we'd be putting more money towards health and social interventions. It's also critical that we try to uh, achieve better outcomes rather than focus only on drug consumption. If you look at uh, the US discussion on this subject, you'll see that the, almost the entire focus is on consumption rather than on the outcomes that matter to people in this room. Deaths, disease, crime, corruption, those sorts of things. Uh, policy has to be based on evidence and also policy has to be based on trying to get the best return on investment. There was a reference a moment ago to needle syringe programs uh, and in the most recent estimate commissioned by the Department of Health in Canberra, uh, carried out by independent experts, a uh, dollar spent on needle syringe programs saved four dollars in healthcare costs and saved twenty-seven dollars overall. Um, so there's a considerable benefit from investing in the needle syringe programs. A dollar spent on methadone programs saved somewhere between four and ten dollars. Uh, What's now happening in Western Europe and also in uh, South America in a number of countries is we're seeing a reduction or even the elimination in penalties for personal drug possession or consumption. And Portugal, of course, is leading the way in this. Uh, we will have to do something to focus particularly on the drug users who are severely dependent and having experiencing a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. Uh, they're not only causing problems for themselves, um, they're certainly doing that, but they're also causing a lot of problems for their community and especially for their families. And to address that, we will need to do something about taking the treatment of drug users seriously. And that has to mean expanding the capacity, improving the quality and broadening the range of options. 
so that we attract and retain and benefit these people in treatment. Taxing and regulating cannabis is clearly going to be critical, not just in California, but uh, all around the world, including Australia. Then comes the possibility of, uh, if the, all of the above haven't really been seen to be effective enough, we may also need to allow for the sale of, retail sale of uh, dilute preparations of small quantities of recreational drugs. Uh, and this is often referred to as legalisation. Really, we should be referring to this as re-legalisation because we've been there before. Uh, this is not doing something uh, novel and experimental. It's going back to how things were before 1906 when, as I mentioned, edible opium was taxed and regulated in this country and legally available. And um, Before 1903, Coca-Cola contained cocaine. Uh, so we've been down this road before. In, in several countries in South America, coca tea bags are available for sale. You put them in a cup and you boil, boil it, pour in the boiling water and you have a cocaine infusion. So it's, this is not uh, a case of the sky falling in. This is uh, territory we've been down before. And I expect that uh, this is where the psychedelics will fit in, that there will be some psychedelics that may be sold um, in a regulated, some kind of regulated fashion uh, like this. I recently had the pleasure or displeasure of reading an article in the Herald Sun by Steve Price about a month ago. He, uh, he indicated that harm reduction was just a euphemism for legalisation. He went on to say that individuals advocating for harm reduction as a guise for legalisation are being led by their messiah, Alex Wodak. <laughs> so my, my, my question to you is twofold. <laughs> a, how do you feel about uh, assuming this new status as messiah? <laughs> and B, how, how do we move forward with evidence-based policy in the face of such uneducated or ignorant opposition? Okay, that's a, thank you for the question. That's a very important question. I'll, I'll just um, recapitulate some of the history that some of you may not know about. Um, the, uh, Australia's official national drug policy, harm minimisation, was adopted by the then Prime Minister Bob Hawke, uh, the six uh, Premiers, uh, and the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. The ACT didn't have self-government at that time. On the 2nd of April, 1985, and amongst that, on that gathering that day in Canberra, uh, the um, Premier of Queensland was no less than Joe Bielka-Peterson. So this is, wasn't a Labor, uh, it wasn't something that Labor bashed through the system. Uh, Bielka-Peterson, uh, one of the most conservative figures of all time in Australian politics, was, was party to that agreement. Uh, that agreement has now been uh, independently evaluated by uh, in, independent experts uh, six times we're just going through this process now again and each time the independent evaluators have recommended that harm minimisation is retained and each time the Ministerial Council on Drug Strategy which is our police and health ministers have voted to support it, to continue it. So it's well entrenched in the system and both sides of politics when they've formed government at the federal level and the state territory level have followed harm minimisation, there's no doubt about it. And now we have uh, something like uh, 80 countries around the world uh, have adopted harm minimisation and every single major UN body that has some responsibility for drug policy uh, has also endorsed harm reduction as it's known outside Australia. And also some non-UN organisations that are very critical, very important. So the Red Cross, uh, World Bank, um, the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Uh, these are all uh, non-UN organisations that have uh, adopted harm reduction. So, of course, what Steve Price is saying is unadulterated nonsense. And people will say nonsense in this area for decades to come. We have to get used to that. You know, there, there are still people who say that tobacco doesn't cause lung cancer. There's still people who say global warming is not occurring and so on. So... Uh, there, there's no, there's no, um, you know, there's no limit to uh, people saying things that are clearly untrue. Um, but it's very important for an audience like this to be acquainted with the history. I hope that answers your question. 
I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Portugal, uh, what happened there, how it happened, and if we can learn anything about it uh, from their example. Well, um, I was present at a meeting in London. There was a private meeting that was chaired by George Soros in <laughs> South Kensington, and in about it was about six or seven years ago, and he brought together the major uh, drug policy figures from Western Europe. And when the Portuguese, uh, when it came to the port time for the Portuguese to speak, they said, uh, we knew we were going to win the next elections in Portugal, and we knew that something had to be done seriously uh, about the mess of drug policy in Portugal. So we looked around Europe, and only two countries at that time made any sense to us, uh, Netherlands and Switzerland. We studied what they had done, and we came to the conclusion that they hadn't gone near far enough. And so we determined that when we got into power, we would go much further. And we worked out what we would do, we got into power, and we did it. And it was very clear very soon afterwards that what we had done was, was working. And then when we lost power, our opponents didn't change any of our policies. And so uh, that's um, what's really happened in Portugal. There, there are now uh, several... Uh, excellent um, reviews of what's happened in Portugal. There's a review on the Cato Institute website, which is very well known and has been very influential, particularly in the United States. And there's uh, a new article that just went up on the, I think it's the British Journal of Criminology, uh, just in the last week or so, and it's by uh, Caitlin Hughes from the University of New South Wales, and also by Alex Stevens, who's the other author. And the, this is a much more scholarly uh, version of the Cato Institute report, but basically comes to the same conclusion that um, it's, been, um, uh, it's been a new approach and it, it is clearly a new approach and it is clearly working and there is a great deal of interest in Western Europe um, and there's also great interest in that in South America. And... Uh, as a result, I'm sure, uh, at least partly of what's happened in Portugal, um, there was a, a commission, a South American Commission on Drug Policy that was uh, established by three former presidents uh, of South America, uh, Zadia from Mexico, Gaviria from Colombia, and Caradoso from Brazil. And they prepared a report which uh, basically said we've got to be able to talk about this stuff. We've got to stop the taboo on even discussing this subject. Didn't really go very far in terms of policy recommendations, although that was implicit in uh, a lot of the discussion. Now what's happened is that, that that South American Commission is about to go global. And there's a meeting in Geneva uh, next month where those three South American uh, former presidents are going to be um, are going to be joined by f former president of Switzerland Ruth Dreyfus, uh, former U.S. Secretary of State, a former U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, and some other um, very notable figures. And we're seeing this now become uh, a global movement, as it should be. It's long overdue. Uh, and don't forget also that the, the the missing ingredient in all of this in the last few years has been the, the terrible financial mess that many governments around the world in, in the Western world find themselves in, Western Europe and also in the United States of America. And the severity and the seriousness of that cr financial crisis uh, should not be underestimated by any of us. And so they're looking now for government expenditure that is wasteful um, and... Uh, what better examples of wasteful government expenditure are there than the war against drugs? So I think we're the, uh, that was clearly part of the impetus behind Proposition 19 in California, and I think in the, 19, in the 2012, 2014, and 16 elections in the United States, we're going to see more and more moves toward, to try and rein in this wasteful expenditure. Uh, and we're also going to see that in Western Europe and other parts of the world. And we're also just starting to see this process occurring in Asia. Uh, so next week I go to Kuala Lumpur and a series of meetings, and this is the beginnings of uh, uh, 
support for drug law reform uh, from Malaysians in Malaysia. And one of the significant figures taking part in the uh, in the meeting in Malaysia is a, is a Datuk, uh, meaning a, a lord in Malaysian terms, um, high a, a noble sir, and um, this particular person who's really playing a central role in the meeting uh, is a former commissioner of police and is also a former commissioner of corrective services. So we're starting to see an in uh, homegrown drug law reform even starting in Asia, and not uh, a moment too soon. Hi. Um, I've noticed in the, the new, in the proposed models that there seems to be a, an emphasis on harm reduction for existing users and a, probably a fair assumption that there'll be a reduction in new users. Uh, my question is, where do new users fit into the proposed models? For instance, someone turns 18, decides they want to try methamphetamine. Where does that fit in and how is society as a whole going to react to that? Well, that's, thank you. That's also an important question. And uh, my assumption is that there will always be a black market, uh, that we're never going to eradicate a market. There's always going to be a demand uh, for drugs that uh, authorities and the majority of citizens are not going to be comfortable supplying. And uh, where that happens, uh, uh, if there's no legal source available, then other sources will emerge. And that will be true for... Uh, hallucinogenic drugs as it is will be for sedatives and also for stimulants. So uh, I don't want to convey the impression to you that uh, the sorts of things I've been outlining are going to uh, completely solve this problem and everything will be perfect. So there will be, uh, there will be a black market and people who want to experiment with drugs for the first time will presumably uh, either buy strong drugs from the black market or weak drugs in small quantities uh, from the regulated retail market. And I, that's how I see this developing. Uh, we do have some indications that, that the black market will shrink very considerably if the kind of proposals that I've been outlining are adopted and accepted. So there's an important paper in The Lancet in 2006 looked at what had happened in the city of Zurich over a 12-year period from 1990 to 2002. And during that period, there was saturation provision, this is my word, not theirs, saturation provision of uh, uh, opiate tr treatment for opiate users. Um, they had abstinence treatment, they had heroin-assisted treatment, they had methadone and other treatments as well. And what happened uh, is that the number of new heroin users was estimated to have fallen from 850 in 1990 to 150 in 2002, and coinciding with that was a fall in HIV infections, drug overdose deaths, crime, and also in the quantity of heroin seized. Now, uh, I think what that means is that people were moving from the black market to the white market, and that's indeed what the authors speculated. Of course, hard to prove that sort of thing. So the reason I bring that up in relation to amphetamines and other drugs is I think that when we start to uh, have a more flexible drug treatment system and we allow for severely dependent people who are in a lot of trouble, we allow for them to get their drugs through, through a regulated system with some supervision and assistance, that we'll bring in some of the most severely dependent highest consumers who account disproportionately for the problems and we'll bring them in, get them some help, and we'll probably see the black market shrink. But it disappear? Probably never. Hope that answers your question. 